influx of casualties. But military leaders say the toll on Iraqi forces is much heavier. In fact, some 20,000 Iraqi troops now have given up to Allied forces. Many Iraqi units face, face, uh, we faced until now, will not be fighting another day. Some Iraqi prisoners of war showed why they may have been so eager to surrender. They practically swarmed all over a Saudi officer who was passing out food packages and told officials they were lucky if they got one meal a day when they were in the field. For Kuwaiti soldiers, this is Independence Day, the retaking of their homeland. But there are still some pockets of resistance. This Saudi tank unit came under fire from a hidden Iraqi artillery unit. The Iraqi army tried another kind of missile attack against Allied ships, pounding Iraqi troop positions from the sea. British officials say they shot down a silkworm missile aimed directly at the USS Missouri. They say a radar operator aboard the HMS Gloucester detected the missile when it was launched. Whilst it can only be conjecture as to exactly who was the target, clearly the 500 kilograms of warhead inside the silkworm could well have caused considerable, if not fatal damage, to its target. And there's certainly one ship out there at present who has good reason to be thankful to the alert radarman. Satellite pictures showed more fires burning inside Kuwaiti oil fields, some 600 so far, according to the Pentagon. A black oily fog has drifted as far as Baghdad, but troops are reporting few problems from the thick smoke so far. Their land attack is pressing on ahead of schedule, according to military officials. Allied troops are now reported to be less than 50 miles away from Kuwait City. And tonight, American tanks are racing toward a potentially huge battle with Iraq's Republican Guard. But though resistance from Iraqi troops is reported low so far, American military leaders say the big push has only just begun. To date, we have employed only a small portion of our total combat power. There is much more to come. And military leaders late today indicate they are not changing their strategy despite the apparent call for retreat by Saddam Hussein. The announcement said the withdrawal would be made in accordance with the Soviet peace proposal that was discussed last week. But a Soviet spokesman tonight said Moscow had not heard about this new withdrawal plan yet. Well, joining us right now to uh, sort of help us sort through the latest development in the Persian Gulf crisis is foreign policy expert Dr. Marshall Windmiller, the professor of international studies at San Francisco State University. Professor Windmiller, thank you once again for joining us. Uh, what is your reaction now to word that Iraq says it's going to pull out of Kuwait? Just another stalling tactic, do you think? Well, I don't think it's a stalling tactic because his forces are really in great danger of being destroyed. I, I think his timing is very bad. He should have done this before the ground war began, and uh, he could have gotten uh, a considerable advantage. But now I think the, the uh, momentum of the war is going to make it extremely difficult for his forces to get out of there. Uh, and uh, what he really has now is a choice not of withdrawal, but of surrender or destruction. But with the rhetoric that he has been using, might this be construed as a victory for Saddam Hussein in some way? Well, one way in which it might be a victory is if his forces try to leave with their uh, equipment and uh, they engage the American forces that are well into Iraq now and a battle takes place on Iraq soil. Uh, this would put us in a position of being beyond the UN mandate and would look very bad to the world community. And I think in those circumstances, he might uh, get an important political victory. There, of course, will have to be some sort of uh, peace settlement negotiated in the Mideast. Uh, how much strength will Saddam Hussein have, do you think? Not very much, although it depends on the general response of the international community, particularly the French and the Soviets. Uh, to what extent they are interested in preserving Iraq as a significant power in the region. And uh, their, their attitudes, I think, will be much more determining than Saddam Hussein's himself. And his position within the political system of Iraq may be greatly eroded after all of this. Thank you once again for your insight. That is Dr. Marshall Windmiller. He is a professional of international, international studies at San Francisco State University. It, uh, it really is, is still very tough to get some up to the minute news from the front, but KGO's Greg Jarrett flew into combat with the very first wave of Army airborne troopers, and early today he managed to file this report. It vividly details just how tough it is to get the story and get it back to the States. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a story, and I want you to listen to me very carefully, and I think you'll be able to sense my frustration. On my pool, Mike Von Fremd with ABC and myself, 
Uh, we have a reporter from Reuters. We have a reporter from the Los Angeles Times and a photographer from Time Magazine. Yesterday, we were part of the invading force into Iraq. I was in a helicopter that was loaded with JP-8 jet fuel on the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, I asked the pilot if we start taking rounds, if somebody starts shooting at us, what happens? And they said we would go up in a ball of flame. But we took that risk to go in and get the story. We went deep into Iraq in that helicopter because that was our only form of transportation. So we got in there. We worked all day long interviewing these first troops into Iraq, dug into their positions, the Pathfinders, the Long Range Recon Patrols. We were up there with them during the early morning hours. And uh, when we got back, we had our stories all prepared to go on the helicopter, and we were told that Dick Cheney had imposed a news blackout. So they froze our material. Then we heard, just after the deadline, to get that material on the air, that the deadline had been lifted. So we missed re reporting the first day of the war, literally risking our lives to get the story. And then they froze it. So that's why they gave us permission to use the telephones today to be able to talk with you people back in the States and let you know what happened and how successful the invasion has been to this point. Frustrations from KGO's Greg Jarrett, who was with the 18th Airborne along the Iraqi-Saudi border when he filed that report. He says that by the end of the first day of combat, chopper pilots were reported that it was very hard to find targets because the Iraqi army appeared to be in full retreat. In this country, a group of anti-war protesters camped outside the White House is reportedly getting on the president's nerves. The drum-beating demonstrators have been banging out their message from Lafayette Park off and on since the war began. The demonstration has prompted comments from administration officials. They say that sound is getting annoying for people who work and live in the White House. Protesters say that is exactly their intent. And protesters on both sides of the Gulf War issue engaged in a spirited debate at San Francisco State University today. Between 100 and 150 students, most of them supporting Operation Desert Storm, and the state of Israel claim it's a misperception that the campus is solidly against the war. The counter demonstrators made sure their voices were heard as well. Well, the protest lasted about 90 minutes, no reports of any violence, and there were no arrests. The ground war in reaction to it here at home as Bay Area Bridge authorities on continued security alert. Police say earlier three men climbed the north tower of the Golden Gate Bridge this morning and tried to unfurl an anti-war banner. They were removed and arrested. A woman who reportedly drove the men onto the bridge was also arrested. That incident occurred just before morning, morning rush hour. The CHP says it was not entirely we unexpected. We have uh, CHP officers from throughout the Bay Area uh, this week covering uh, the two San Francisco bridges to ensure that there is no interruption of traffic, and there was not any this morning. All four suspects were charged with trespassing and creating a public nuisance. The unidentified woman was also charged with resisting arrest and giving false information to a peace officer. All were given court dates and released on their own recognizance. And in Southern California, in the communities around the Marine Base at Camp Pendleton, there is little anti-war sentiment. Many residents of towns like Oceanside and Escondido have family or friends who are serving in the Persian Gulf. I don't think people are in favor of war. However, I, uh, I do think we're in favor of freedom. And uh, when the Iraqis invaded Kuwait, uh, it was time for us to make a move. I think we should get in there and liberate Kuwait as soon as possible. Are you reasonably happy with the way things appear to be going? Absolutely. I yeah. think it was a mistake to start. Yeah. But now that we're into it, um, do you have any thoughts about it? Yeah. Let's finish it off. Good. Camp Pendleton is the home of the 1st Marine Division, most of which is currently on duty in the Gulf. Well, a Navy fighter pilot from Nevada hopes he'll soon be serving in Operation Desert Storm. It wasn't long ago when he thought his military career was over. But as Channel 7's Paul Jeske reports, modern surgery has helped him return to the pilot seat. Salutes with three fingers and a toe. And Navy fighter pilot Joseph Satrapa also uses a transplanted toe to fly his F-18 jet train pilots at the Naval Strike Weapons Center in Fallon, Nevada. The Navy commander lost his thumb and severely damaged the rest of his right hand two years ago while test firing a weapon. But Dr. Harry Bunky of San Francisco's Davies Medical Center was able to rebuild the flyer's finger. We actually used his index finger to rebuild his long finger because he blew out these two bones here. So he has, he's got his index finger backing up his long finger and we transplanted this whole big toe. What's this? big metatarsal joint 
so that he can grab. He can, he, can, uh, he can grab, he can grab the stick, and he can press buttons and things like that. The operation worked so well that the Navy declared Satrapa combat ready. The pilot never doubted. Once I had a thumb up there, because I knew that I, if I could do this pinch in motion, I could move all the switches, I could perform all the emergency procedures in the cockpit. The pilot has no trouble walking, despite the loss of the right toe used for the transplant. And without a thumb, he never would have been able to fly again. You can fly without your feet, but you can't fly without your thumb. And the flyer couldn't be more satisfied. I understand that your, your, uh, your code name used to be Hoser. Yes, sir. And as soon as they moved my toe up there, they changed that to Tozer for the teeth. <laughs> his only disappointment is that his Navy certification may have come too late to serve in Desert Storm. In San Francisco, Paul Jeske, Channel 7 News. Tozer, eh? Mm. Remarkable story. We have, uh, of course, much more as Channel 7 News uh, at 5 continues. More on the Gulf War, including a look at the significant role black soldiers have played over the years in the American military. But next, getting around, or trying to get around, when the Embarcadero comes down. And when in drought, I find a spring. Highway 101 near Moffett Field is open at this hour after a bomb scare turned real and forced authorities to close the freeway for over an hour today. Traffic backed up for miles while authorities removed explosives. A Caltrans driver found six cylindrical devices stuck in holes of a cyclone fence just north of Moffett Field on northbound 101. CHP immediately shut down 101 in both directions while Sheriff's Department bomb experts removed the threat. They say the devices were not bombs but were booby-trapped to go off. This is one of the six and I'm using a glove because we're going to see if we can come up with any physical evidence. It's a uh, M11582 uh, military device, and it's uh, referred to as a artillery simulator. And it uh, has a uh, burning fuse and uh, has a system where it can be booby-trapped, and uh, all six of them were booby-trapped to be uh, set off if someone uh, didn't handle them properly. Anderson says they have no suspects. No one is claiming credit for them. He emphasizes the devices were not a threat to Moffett Field or any buildings. They were old, and he speculates they were probably stolen from a military base somewhere, but not Moffett Field. As we say, traffic reported back to normal at this hour. Well, these are the final days of the Embarcadero Freeway. At noon on Wednesday, the wrecking ball officially comes down on that controversial roadway. And with demolition comes new traffic nightmares. Channel 7's Janet Yee joins us live now to give us the specifics. Janet. A nightmare it is, Cheryl. I'm at the foot of Howard Street and Embarcadero. This is where phase one will begin. Officially, the ceremony is Wednesday, but Thursday is when actually the official demolition will begin. It's expected to be the most difficult part of the, uh, the demolition. What it means is dismantling both decks of the freeway, as you can see behind me, from Howard Street to Mission a few blocks away. The difficulty is with the structure's close proximity to buildings and traffic. And for these reasons, there will be closures. Northbound Embarcadero will be reduced to one lane only. Howard Street will be closed completely, this between Stewart and the Embarcadero. The city is also warning all streets in the construction area will have strict parking enforcement. Now, phase one is expected to take about three weeks. Caltrans says some 28,000 vehicles use this corridor every day, and for that reason, there will have to be some changes in our traffic patterns. And coming up on Channel 7 News at 6, I'll tell you how to get around the mess. All right, Janet, thanks very much for that report. Okay, the traffic problems, drought problems, and if you think it could get worse, guess what? It can. Governor Pete Wilson announced today there is no surplus of water in the state water project. What little is left is already accounted for. While the governor did not invoke emergency powers to deal with the shortage, he warned that he may have to in the future. Two federal legislators are trying to find solutions to the problems. Representatives Robert Lagomarsino from Ventura and Norman Mineta from San Jose have introduced legislation that would allow California water districts to get water from other places. If we can get water, let's say, from Idaho or Washington, put that water into our system and transport it within the state of California. And so what I'm trying to do is to open up that opportunity for us to get water from other areas and transport it in state or federal uh, projects. Currently under the Warren Act of 1911, only water that's destined for agricultural use can be transported in federal aqueducts. Well, we just can't get away from it. Lots of folks living in Bay Area counties with strict rationing measures are becoming quite resourceful in coping with the drought. Some have even found a way to get water for free. They're being drawn to a spring near Highway 92 west of Highway 280. 
Channel 7 Naturalist Brian Hackney shows us more as California gets down to the last drop. This is the top of Hetch Hetchy Dam, and this is the top of Hetch Hetchy Water, 240 feet below. At Tahoe, the lake is at its lowest level ever recorded, but there is one place where the well hasn't run dry yet. I don't really care for the tap water to drink, and I like it for coffee or tea. A lot of people use it for cooking, too. Even if I don't always taste the difference in the cooking, I know that I have the feeling that the water's fresh. Does it really taste better? She says so. <laughs> and that's the boss. <laughs> they have been lining up for it along Highway 92 for years. Mountain spring water at Lombardi Spring. It's fresh and it's free. Take a trunk full. And how long would 20 gallons last? Oh, about three, four months. But you do have to make sure your cup doesn't runneth over. Is there a rule about this? Well, they got a sign there because people, they get mad if you don't. Oh, you only take 10 gallons at a time. Right, if people are waiting. And they might wait forever someday. With the drought, has the flow changed? Oh, very much. Slowed it down to about one quarter of what it was. But it still tastes good. Yeah, it's uh, edible. <laughs> Oh, it is good to it. I'm missing chlorine. That's the only thing. Oh, no, I'm fine. You can go right ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, the spring has been here for years, but people at the U.S. Geological Survey tell us as well that if the drought does continue, a lot of springs may dry up, including this one. At the Lombardi Springs, I'm Brian Hackney, Channel 7 News. <laughs> we'll just try a little drop when he gets back, I think. Still to come on Channel 7 News at 5 as we continue. The federal government comes under fire by survivors and others following up on the LAX runway collision. Also, our meteorologist Pete Giddings with the forecast. <laughs> and later on, Dr. Dina Dell will be here to take your house calls. You know you can call him right now. What's that number, sir? Well, the number, as you see on your screen, is 1-800-621-7777. How can you tell the good guys from the other guys? Our low price guarantee. The other guys talk about low prices, but the good guys guarantees them. The Bush administration is under fire for reportedly tying up airport safety funds. Funds that could have helped prevent a runway collision this month in Los Angeles. The crash at LA International Airport killed 34 people when an air traffic controller allowed two planes to take off from the same runway. A House Transportation Subcommittee was told today that the airport was operating with outdated and broken radar system. They were also told that money from a $7 billion Federal Aviation Trust Fund was supposed to pay for new radar, but is instead being used to balance the budget. Most passengers on the U.S. Air jet survived the collision, but then died from smoke and fire. A survivor of the crash said those deaths could have been prevented if only the plane had been equipped with advanced fire retardant material. Investigators in Philadelphia are waiting for a 39-story high-rise building to cool down before trying to find what caused a 12-alarm fire there. That blaze started Saturday night on the 22nd floor of the Meridian Plaza building across from City Hall. It burned for nearly 19 hours before it was brought under control with the help of sprinklers on the 30th floor. Three firefighters died of smoke inhalation and 13 others were injured. Tonight, major streets and businesses around the building remain closed because officials are afraid damaged floors could collapse. And time now for our yep. meteorologist Pete Giddings. We're hoping that R word is in the forecast. Well, it's not in the forecast, but it's in the outlook. Yes. How's that? Yes. yes. Sounds Let's good. take a look now <laughs> right. at the way it is through Sutrocal. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Fog moving back into the picture, and it will be moving locally inland. As we'll show you, it didn't really ever leave uh, very far away from the coast. Let's take a look at the Iraqi theater. And what you'll get to see is that there is a big blob of clouds that are covering the southern portion of Iraq. Now, the eastern clouds will probably leave, but as you'll see when we go back 24 hours, this blob is coming up. And to follow the trajectory they've been going from the Mediterranean, top of Libya, down through Egypt, and then back up on the trough, so you can see them come right back up out of there, more forming, and uh, we could probably extrapolate it being going into night here is going into day there, so tomorrow will be 
It looks like cloudy for the better portion of the day. Coming back home, one of the better looking systems that we've seen. We've got the moisture. We've got cold air coming around. There are a couple of things that are happening I don't like. Don't like to see where they break away from their own lows, and I don't like to see anything grab any of the cold air, which is taking place. So what could happen? The scenario could be that this system will move in up against the ridge, weaken it, start shoving it back to the east, but then the eastern portion starts to evaporate. We'll know that very rapidly. And if that starts, then probably it will lose most of its uh, support, and this will be the next one that we'll keep an eye on. But right now, things look good for late Wednesday, getting something in here. We have a split flow. We we are not expecting the energy to go north. We're expecting this entire package to move over so that we get a southwest flow so that the southern portion, central portion of the state will be getting it nice wet snow for up in the mountains. Let's set it in motion. You'll get to see the energy just whipping to the north. We'd like to see that entire package, as it, you see it there, continue to move. But it's still a long way out there, 1,200 miles. A lot of things can happen. So make sure you watch tonight at 11 and again tomorrow. The fog along the coast, starting at about the uh, Point Arena area south, as day goes on, you'll see it push back slightly in a couple of holes, but watch, the sun's going down, <coughs> clever's back up. It only made it to 56 degrees today at Half Moon Bay. They never did get to see the sun as the fog sat there all day. The forecast then for tonight, coastal fog will be spreading locally inland, 36 to 48 the range. Tomorrow, the coastal clouds will stay there, but it'll be sunny and cooler elsewhere. As you can see, temperatures down. Will tonight give you a uh, uh, run down on the record highs. I'm sure there are many of them around the Bay Area. 58 to 74 for our range tomorrow. So keep your fingers crossed. All right. Say dear. a prayer. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. So, thank you. And stay with us, please. Up next, the latest from the Gulf. Plus, we'll switch live to Southern California, where troops are taking part in more desert storm training. Well, that forecast a second time, and hi, we're back, aren't we? <laughs> also, we're going to, to talk about uh, President Bush uh, honoring some uh, black GIs serving in Desert Storm and also black heroes. We'll also look at the part they have played throughout America's military history. We are coming back. And the latest at this hour from the war in the Persian Gulf. Saddam Hussein has apparently issued an order to his troops to retreat to completely pull out of Kuwait. That is according to Baghdad Radio. While reports from the Pentagon say they have scattered evidence to indicate troops are beginning to surrender. The White House says it is extremely skeptical of this new announcement, as are the other coalition allies. The spokesperson for President Bush says, and we quote, the war goes on. But despite major Iraqi losses, Iraq did manage its first successful Scud missile attack against a military installation. At this hour, 12 American soldiers are confirmed dead after a Scud warhead slammed into a barracks in the military complex in Tehran. 25 soldiers are wounded, but 40 troops are still missing. We've heard reports from military briefings on the Gulf War that it is expected to be over fairly soon. And yet, desert storm training continues. We get more now from Bob Banfield from our sister station, KBC in Southern California. Bob is standing by live at Fort Irwin. Bob? And, Cheryl, I think the interesting uh, point you would think that people that are training to go over there into the war zone would be very much interested and at a buzz a little bit when that uh, word came out today that uh, Hussein uh, told his troops they were pulling out. And uh, for a while, I guess it was a, a bit of a concern. Major John Wagstaff uh, has talked with a lot of people here. And John, wh what's the feeling about that announcement? Well, I think everybody here is a little suspicious of Saddam Hussein and his uh, intent. Uh, clearly, it would appear that this is just uh, Saddam Hussein re-agreeing to the original Soviet proposal, which President Bush turned down uh, earlier this week. So that's pretty much it. Pessimism. The war goes on, says Washington, and certainly here, the training for war goes on. Beginning at sunrise, two companies of armor and infantry, members of the Georgia National Guard, began a ground and air assault on an Iraqi-type defensive position. The tanks required to breach a tank trench to get their infantry to the enemy forces. This is very much like the real thing. The action is realistic as is possible to make it without actual live fire. In these exercises, laser beams take out both soldiers and armament. The Georgia Guard has greatly improved in its fighting ability since the two months they've spent here. Their training will be completed in about two days.
We mentioned that concern about the guard because there was a, co a concern about the condition of the guard, the readiness of the guard. But now these uh, fellows say they're ready to go wherever they might send them. Uh, they'll complete their training here in a few days, and then another guard unit from Mississippi will come in for desert training. I'm Bob Banfield for Channel 7 News at Fort Irwin in Southern California. Okay, Bob, thanks very much. Just ahead as Channel 7 News at 5 continues this Monday, President Bush salutes Black History Month, and our Bay Area Focus explores the role of African Americans in the military. But first, Anna Chavez joins us now from the newsroom with a look at what is coming up at 6. Anna. Cheryl and Donna, ahead on the news at 6 tonight, the drought story moves to the fields of California rice as growers fight for all the water they can get. And have you noticed that gas prices are down? Well, we're going to take a second look at the war's effect on our economy on the home front. And if it's true that we are what we eat, you'll be interested in the new report, a major new report on fatty diets, cancer, and the eating habits of Northern Californians. These stories and more ahead on the news at 6. But now let's get back to Cheryl and Don and the rest of the news at 5. Thank you, Anna. We'll see you at uh, 6 o'clock. President Bush calls the Pentagon the greatest equal opportunity employer around. And he says that's underscored by the number of African Americans serving in Operation Desert Storm. In White House ceremonies honoring Black History Month, the president responded to criticism some black leaders have expressed about the number of blacks at the front. Blacks make up 12% of the U.S. population, 20% of the military, and as much as 30% of the Army ground forces. Look at those brave men and women uh, putting their lives on the line for us. And you don't see colors or creed. All you see are Americans, good, brave, dedicated Americans. Americans who volunteered, each and every single one of them who put their devotion to country first, Americans with dignity and pride, calling America back to her better self. The president saluted black heroes and soldiers who served without getting credit for their patriotism, and now that has changed. And today our Bay Area Focus looks at the significant role the black soldier has played in our military history. From the Revolutionary War to today, he and she have given their blood in the defense of freedom. The black people in America have always had to fight from behind. They had to prove something. Pastor Leroy Johnson joined the military in 1945. His career would span 40 years in the Navy and Army. He was the first black to get a line officer's commission in the Naval Reserve. When I first went in service, they said, hey, if you can walk on water, fortunate, you'll retire as a major. And if you're fortunate enough to walk two inches above water, you might make lieutenant colonel. So uh, instead, I made full colonel. Uh, because of the civil rights movement. But it wasn't always so. Black soldiers would suffer the slings of discrimination, hostilities. General Benjamin Davis, the first black general in the Air Force. His father had enlisted in the Spanish-American War and against all odds rose to the rank of general in the U.S. Cavalry. I learned that the impossible could be achieved. He taught me the very important human quality of perseverance. But he struggled. When he enrolled in West Point in 1932, other cadets invoked a code of silence against him. Davis was forced to eat, sleep, study, and ride alone. I was treated as being a person unworthy of being at West Point because I was a black man. The only effect that that had on me was to make me more and more determined to stay there for four years and to be graduated and go into the Army. And he did, becoming the first black cadet to graduate this century. When World War II erupted, he became a pilot in the Army Air Corps. The 99th Squadron he commanded would go on to distinguish itself. During World War II, nearly a million blacks served in the armed forces. But the segregation would not come until 1948 in a presidential order from Harry Truman. The significance of blacks in the military is chronicled at two San Francisco museums, the Presidio and Fort Point, a forgotten past receiving its recognition. It began with a revolution, a black freeman in Boston killed fighting for freedom. In the Civil War, there were over 186,000 black soldiers serving in the Union Army. They would fight in 449 engagements. 16 black soldiers were awarded Congressional Medals of Honor. From the Civil War to the eve of World War I, black soldiers received first-class military honors. Desertion rates were high and the units were constantly changing where the, the black service remained the same. So many of those men, as you can see, their service chevrons were in the service for 30 years. Up here, you see a photograph, a large panel photograph of the uh, 9th Cavalry at Yellowstone. Now, before the establishment of the National Park Service, 
the U.S. Cavalry guarded those parts. This is the uniform of a very, very important black man during the uh, Indian Wars period, early Spanish-American War. He was a slave-born individual named Alan Allensworth who uh, rose in the ranks, self-educated man, became a lieutenant colonel in the Army Chaplain's Corps. He actually served here during the Spanish-American War era when the 24th Infantry was here in oh. preparation for embarking to the Philippines. And during the Spanish-American War, there was regiments called uh, uh, immunes. And uh, this is the c concept that they were black while well, they were immune. They're tropical-oriented, so they're immune from all these diseases. And several regiments were, were raised to take to the Philippines and Cuba on the concept that they couldn't catch malaria. Did they? Of course they did. <laughs> After World War I, they were, a lot of the old regiments were broken up, and these men were uh, made as stevedores and uh, dock helpers and cooks and things of this nature. And it was the last of the golden age of the, the black men in the United States Army. Integration, Vietnam, the black soldier surviving the war in Southeast Asia. That service continues today in the Gulf, Blacks seeking opportunities, escaping poverty, join the military. It's why there's such a large percentage of blacks in the war. We feel that we got to be the best, you see. We got we to show everybody that, hey, we can do it. And, uh, and so going into military service, fighting for their country, was one way to do that. A really interesting display of black military history continues at both Fort Point and the Presidio Museums. A lot of old photographs there that have never been seen before. I'm sorry, I missed that in my history classes. <laughs> Good just information. Got in. Thank you. Thanks. Still ahead as the News at 5 continues, a Pleasant Hill mother plays the waiting game as her son surfs in Operation Desert Storm. And the message about measles is coming soon. Well, there's the mother who... Uh, son is uh, obviously overseas and we'll have the story about measles coming actually to a billboard near you soon. The city of San Francisco should come up with five million dollars to help the city's children. Well, that's what the Children's Budget Coalition contends. They say the money is desperately needed for family resource centers, health care, drug treatment and counseling. A coalition of 45 groups sent the request to the mayor and board of supervisors today saying the city is not trying hard enough to find that money. One of our funding ideas is that we reallocate the $100,000 that now goes to 49er tickets for the general manager of Rec and Park and the Rec and Park Commission uh, to services for disabled children and services for our children who live in the housing projects. According to the coalition, the city could save up to I'm 10 times what it now spends if it put more money into preventative programs. Well, measles is a disease that can be deadly, but it is also preventable. Last year, one person died in Alameda County and 400 others came down with measles. And that's why the County Health Department and the City of Oakland are joining with the private sector to launch a massive education campaign. Channel 7's Willie Monroe has more. Good boy. This momentary discomfort could be a lifesaver. Alameda County and Oakland City officials are conveying that message with a new billboard campaign encouraging measles vaccinations. Measles is a nasty disease. While we used to think of it as a routine disease of childhood, and in fact it is. It's A, preventable, and B, can be very lethal. In fact, just uh, last week, six children in Philadelphia died as a result of measles. We don't want this to happen here in Alameda County. County officials say they're not in any immediate danger of a measles epidemic. They're calling this a kind of preemptive strike to avoid the 400 cases and one death that occurred last year. This is a community that cares, that is stressing a healthy city, and that immunization, along with education, uh, as a preventive strategy, we think makes a lot of sense. Inner city and non-English speaking children may be at the greatest risk, so half of the 80 billboards will be in Spanish. The $25,000 worth of advertising is being donated by Patrick Media Group and Gannett Outdoor. The companies are being applauded for this public health campaign, but they have been criticized for prominently advertising in minority communities such unhealthy products as cigarettes and alcohol. So far, only a few measles cases have been reported this year. This is a campaign designed to keep the problem from getting worse during what is known as the measles season. In Oakland, Willie Monroe, Channel 7 News. And still ahead as Channel 7 News at 5 continues, anxious on the home front. Stay with us, though, but next, Dr. Benadel takes your house calls. 
Explore the Santa Cruz mountain spot that breaks the laws of gravity. Oh. Something weird really is going on here. Makes a compass spin out of control. I was nauseated immediately. And attracts Japanese tourists in droves. Welcome to the mystery spot. Tony Russomano experiences the force. I believe it. Tonight on Channel 7 News at 11. And it's Monday. We've got another chance to redeem uh, ourselves. Yes. Dr. Yeah, Dean sure. Adele. I've got sure. a serious quiz for you. Serious, but serious I think a very quiz. interesting quiz. Okay. We're going to look at the mortality rates in different wars that the United States has been involved with. And which war do you think the United States soldiers had the lowest mortality rate? This would be deaths per number of soldiers in service. Revolutionary War, Civil War, World War II, Korean War, or the Vietnam War? Hmm. Lowest mortality rate. In other words, I guess the safest war for the, uh, for the soldiers involved. Uh, Jason and Napa, this is Dr. Adele on House Calls. Yeah, uh, hi, Dr. Dill. Um, I have a question. Uh, I've heard a lot of rumors from people that uh, smoking stunts your growth. And mm -hmm. um, I'm, I started smoking when I was a freshman in high school. I'm a senior now. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I've grown to six, six feet tall already. And, uh, I mean, uh, some people have, you know, they're still short, you know, and they did smoke. And I was just, you know, there's a lot of mess up to, behind this rumor. And I was just wondering what the truth yeah. was. Yeah, I'll tell you the truth, but you got to tell me the truth, okay? Okay. What's uh, what's in it for you to smoke? Well, I don't know. It, you know, I I do enjoy smoking. You know, I I mean, I plan to quit someday, and I I just. Hey, do Jason, it. you want to take my word for something? Yeah. It's a crazy attitude yeah, because it is really, really difficult to quit. And when the time comes and it's too late, and maybe you've had your first heart attack, or you've got some emphysema, or you've got no wind left, or you suffer from any one of a number of diseases. Um, You'll regret the decision. The vast majority of smokers regret the decision. And you go back to your first cigarette, the very, very first time, I know for me, the very first time I ever tried it, it was awful. I mean, it made me sick, and it hurt, and it stunk, and yet you go on to the second one. The reason you go on to the second one is simple. It's peer pressure. So you've got to think about it. It's an unattractive habit. You are a minority. You will, will be shunned. You will be thought less of. You'll go to apply to jobs. People look at you like, what kind of stupid person is this J Jason? He smokes. Jason can't be a smart person because he smokes. And I heard the hesitation. And when I asked you why, that hesitation told me that you're not so sure yourself. It does not stunt your growth. It just kills you. That's all plain and, uh, plain and simple, but it it's probably doesn't stunt growth. And a height that you reach is, uh, is more genetic and nutritional than, uh, uh, than anything else. All right, Don in San Francisco, this is Dr. Delia in House Calls. Hi, doctor. I was wondering about the mammograms. Uh, I'm 26 years old, and I was wondering when I should start getting mammograms. And also, um, are they painful? Do they uh, compress the breast uh, tissue yes. to get a good picture? Yeah, they have to compress the breast. And occasionally, women will complain that it's... Um, it's uncomfortable. I don't know. I mean, you know, it depends also on the time of the month. Some women just have more sensitive breasts. Some women's breasts are very painful um, in, in, in the premenstrual period. If you have a mammogram during that time, it's going to be more sensitive. It's not a reason, though, uh, to avoid it. Uh, and a lot of women avoid it because they've heard that it's painful. The vast majority, and I've seen the studies, of I mean, 90-something percent, absolutely uh, no discomfort, but some women it is uncomfortable. More important, at 26, I don't think you're ready for a mammogram. That's a little early. Routine mammography, and there's debate among radiologists whether it should start at age 40. There are a smaller group of doctors at 35. The majority of us feel towards the end of the 40s, early 50s, when routine mammography. One, one film earlier on to have something to compare to. Self-examination, though, always start at this particular age, too. Les and Livermore, this is Dr. Dell. You're on House Calls. Yes, sir, uh, Dr. Dell. I'd yeah. like to ask you about kidney stones, the yeah. treatment, cause, and hopefully what can be done with diet to cure them. Yeah, okay. Well, in uh, 30 seconds... <clears throat> The cause may have something to do with your metabolism, but diet's an important, important role. And I got to tell you, this is, we, we do a lousy job in medicine of this. There's a doctor I know in the Bay Area opened a clinic just for the prevention of kidney stones. He got no referrals because doctors didn't even want to refer patients to this doctor who would tell them what to eat, what not to eat. The basics are avoiding lots of proteins, avoiding uh, certain kinds especially. Lots of fluids are very important. And there are dietary things you can do, but without knowing exactly the kind of stone you have, you know, if you have oxalate stones, avoid a lot of spinach. If you have uh, calcium stones, avoid a lot of calcium. Avoid a lot of protein and meat also for calcium stones. So you've got to know what kind of stone you have. But talk to your doctor. The doctor knows the answer. Get, that, get the answer out of him. All right, which, is, which was the safest war in uh, U.S. history for our soldiers? The lowest mortality rate, Revolutionary Civil War, Korean War, excuse me, World War II, Korean War, or Vietnam? Hmm, we're just guessing. I know, it's a tough one. Yeah. You'll find the answer interesting, though. Korea? 
Korea is the safest? Okay, let's show them the answer. No, actually, uh, it's Vietnam, but you were close. That is a death rate. One in six soldiers in the Civil War died. Wow. One in 40 World War II, Vietnam, one in 151. So no right now, no. Vietnam looms as the safest war we've had. And of course, just if we more can troops, I guess, get yeah. things squared away over there, we could make this the safest. Mm. Absolutely. All right, Let's Dean. hope so. Thank mm -hmm. you. We'll mm -hmm. see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. right. When we come back, a family on the home front. Watching, waiting, and wondering. just a small reminder that stay free is the only pad with arm and hammer baking soda of course we all know that baking soda is the most natural way to absorb odor right right so think arm think hammer then think stay free for protection like nothing else save now with lucky on stay free maxi pads available in unscented and super and stay free thin unscented and save on sure and natural in thin regular and super lucky still the low price leader on your mark, get set to save. Race to Circuit City for the marathon sale and run away a winner with big brand name buys. Like this RCA 20-inch cable-ready TV with easy auto programming and remote. Now just $247. And this estate under-counter dishwasher with dual-level wash. Now a low $199. Race to Circuit City now for the marathon sale and run away a winner. Welcome to Circuit City, where service is state-of-the-art. Finally, one of the war's most difficult jobs continues on the home front. It is the job of waiting, waiting for word from a loved one at the front. A Pleasant Hill family is doing that lonely job tonight. Their son is a Marine. Channel 7's Jack Hansen reports. How does a family cope with seeing their young son move with the incredible swiftness of years from this to this? It was not long ago that Tommy Prado was safe in his father's arms. Now Lance Corporal Thomas Prado, age 22, is on the front lines in Saudi Arabia, serving with the United States Marines. One of nine children, right now Tommy's the focus of attention for his parents, Ramona and John. You know, you raise them up and then, uh... Uh-oh. I said, you know, once you were my little boy, I took care of you, and now you're out there taking care of me and the rest of us here, yeah. you know? Everybody that knows Tommy, anybody that you talk to that knows Tommy would tell you what a nice boy he is. Sometimes I pray a lot for him. Yes, he prays a lot. We all do. And, uh, well, I can't stop thinking about him. Can I get your reaction to what you've seen on television? Well, I'm usually pretty good until I hear words like body bags. <laughs> um, things, you know, that are... are or Marines being killed, and I don't know who it is, and I keep saying, oh, God, don't let it be my son, and I say, but it's somebody's son, and, you know, and then I keep thinking, well, you know, it can't be Tommy. And I keep saying, well, we're no better than anybody else. It could be our son, too. And I also know that I have children over here. One of them could have a car accident or something. You know, death comes to you when it's your time. So if Tommy can go through the worst over there, and if it's not his time, he's going to come back home to me. What would each one of you say to other parents who are going to watch this on television now? Well, the other parents are going through the same things you are. Yeah, the, the hang in there, you know, and pray for them. Have faith in God. In Pleasant Hill, Jack Hansen for Channel 7 News. And that is the News at 5. Thank you for joining us. Take a look now at what's coming up uh, next on Channel 7 News at 6, and here's Richard Brown. Thanks a lot, Don. Next on Channel 7 News, trick or true. The Pentagon tries to verify Baghdad radio reports that Saddam Hussein has ordered a pullout from Kuwait. Meanwhile, at least one dozen soldiers are killed and 40 are missing after an Iraqi Scud attack in the U.S. barracks in Saudi Arabia. Here in the Bay Area, explosives are found strapped to a fence outside Moffett Naval Air Base on the peninsula. Also at 6, a road map to help you get around the demolition of the Embarcadero Freeway. That starts this week. Channel 7 News at 6 is next.